Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first edition of the Jane Austen Summer Watch a Thon. Our first movie is Emma, and I'm actually going to let Jenica explain a bit more about what we're doing, why we're here, because this was her brainchild. She brought us all together. <laughs> and then we'll introduce ourselves in our books, and then we'll start debating <laughs> about okay. very, very different adaptations of Emma. And I'm yeah. right. Great, yes, exciting. Oh, I feel Thank like we're throwing down gauntlet. Down. down, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excited. Um, thanks everyone for like joining us for this, you know, very first installment of our Jane Austen Summer Watchathon, because like we're super excited about it. Um, I know I am. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, Alex and I both have books that are inspired by Jane Austen. So we wanted to do something fun that other Austen lovers would, you know, and anyone who is like bored at home right now, which I know is a lot of people, um, you know, would be able to do and that would be lighthearted and kind of like low stress for everybody um, while we're doing our part at home. So um, yeah, anyway, um, so every couple of weeks we're gonna do this, you know, we're gonna be watching different Austin movies and mini series and discussing them uh, with other Austin living authors. And yeah, we'll tell you what the, what's coming up next after at the end of this particular discussion. But um, so stick around to hear what's coming up next. But um, first let's like all introduce ourselves and um, yeah, our books, please. Mm -hmm. Alexa, maybe you should go first or Jesse, whatever. Uh, well, hi, I'm Alexa. This is my, this this is my channel. channel. <laughs> just went off because of course it did uh yours might have as well and uh i write young adult well or ha i have written young adult science fiction uh romance retelling so my first one was brightly burning which is jane Eyre in space and then my jane austen one is the stars we steal which is inspired by persuasion but really ended up a mashup because once you give Anne Elliot a certain amount of agency, is it really persuasion? You do things to the plot that the purists don't love. And my next book is a YA thriller called The Ivies, and that'll be out next year. Which is going to be really good. It's really exciting. I'm yes. excited. It's excited. It's very different from Jane Austen. Very, very. <laughs> a, lot, a lot more standardized testing than in Jane Austen. Yeah, it's like if every Jane Austen mean girl like was in boarding school right now and like murdered people, right? I mean, that yeah. kind of is my sure. books though, the same. Someone should um, write that. But Mar like, Mary, Crawford. <laughs> Mary Crawford and Lydia Bennett. They're like, uh. the but they both murder people happily. And, <laughs> and Mrs. Elton, obviously. And Mrs. Elton. Oh, oh yes. my God. Oh, Mrs. She Elton has so many things to say about Mrs. Elton. Um, but first myself, uh, hello, I'm Jessica Cluse and I, well, my first series, uh, my first trilogy, the Kingdom on Fire trilogy, which finished up a couple of years back, uh, it's basically, it, it's not a retelling in any way, but it is Austin inspired, Bronte inspired. It's your standard story of young governess in England who has magical powers and has to fight monsters. So, you know, as you were. Uh, my, my next series, which just so happens, oh, here it comes, the book. The book is right here. It's called House of Dragons. It's coming out on Tuesday, May 12th, so in three days. And Yay. here's a beautiful cover. And it's basically uh, like Three Dark Crowns meets The Breakfast Club with dragons. It's a fight to the death uh, for a dragon throne in an empire and only the losers only the losers are competing this time. So, huzzah. Very cool. It's I'm very so awesome and inspired that. too. Yay, <laughs> that'd be cool if it were, but even yeah, if it's not. We're all having tea together, like, oh, cut direct. And then they just like chop each other's heads off. Anyway. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, so I'm Jenica Cohen. Um, I'm the author of Dangerous Alliance, which is a uh, Jane Austen inspired. Um, well, it's a girl. It's about a girl who is a Jane Austen fan and, and living in the time of Jane Austen when she's still writing books. And like Emma Woodhouse, who we're going to be talking about quite a bit, she uh, it has this like ideal life living on an estate in a small village and um, and then some crazy stuff starts to happen and her she finds out that her sister is uh, in an awful marriage and a lot of stuff happens from there. Um, so it's sort of like if Emma Woodhouse's sister had an abusive marriage and then Emma had to get married, I guess. I guess we could kind of spin it that way. But yeah, it's sort of an homage, my homage to Jane Austen and like all of her novels. So anyway. It's really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, let's, I think we should probably start with like our personal rankings of the three movies, just so that everyone knows where we stand, I think. 
this is where it gets really really dirty yeah, yeah. Of, and i mean flying. i feel like we're gonna we're gonna disagree on stuff i think Excellent. i know it's like up front so isn't that what people want they don't want to watch three people yeah, sitting it there be fun there. i liked this exactly as much as you did okay you know well, right. started with emma because a few of the other austin at movies like jenna and i were both like it's great <laughs> was this one like there's strong feelings particularly because the new emma is quite different and just for everyone watching we're referring to the 1996 emma which was a hollywood production starring gwyneth paltrow the 2009 bbc miniseries it was a four-part miniseries with Romola garay as emma i think I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. And then the latest, which is the 2020 Hollywood movie, though by a different studio, and you can kind of tell they have different vibes, starring Anya Taylor-Joy. And they're very different. The three of them are very different, but particularly if you compare like 2020 to like 96. Yes. Yeah. Oh, how far we've come. So different. <laughs> and I, I don't think, well, we'll name our favorites. I have a feeling there's one that none of us have as, as a favorite. We're between two, I think. Okay. Let's find out. Go first. Or not. Alexa, you go first. I'll go first. I'm, I'm honestly easy. My favorite is the 2009 miniseries, which is partly just because of like warm, fuzzy feelings. I just, it's like a comfort watch for me. I like how extensive it is. And I'm honestly just a huge fan of the screenwriter, which is the nerdiest thing to say. But Sandy Welch also wrote the screenplay for my favorite Jane Eyre adaptation of all time, the BBC miniseries, and for North and South, the greatest BBC miniseries of all time. So that's why I feel that way. <laughs> you know what's really interesting, by the way, um, is that I also love the 2006 Jane Eyre adaptation, but my favorite is the one from, I think, was it like 2011 with Michael Fassbender? And uh, and I think it's for the same oh. reason. No, I think it's- do a live chat on that. I have feelings. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do that at some point. <laughs> oh boy. And here's, here's why, here's why. It's because I feel like both the 2011 Jane Eyre and also my personal favorite Emma adaptation, which is 2020, uh, they both get at the heart and the feeling of what, to me, those books evoke. Although I will agree that my second place is the 2009 BBC, and it's a pretty close second place because I completely agree with Alexa. It's it's a comfort watch. That and the 2006 Jane Eyre, I can put those on anytime I'm feeling down and I just feel good and I enjoy them. And like, there's something really to be said for that. But I am, me personally, a stickler for really feeling like, yes, the spirit of that piece was adapted exactly to the screen. And because of that, the 2020 is my personal favorite. Although I really do love, the, I think I love the 2009 more, but I think mm -hmm. I, I just, think that 2020 is the superior adaptation and I really like it. Far last place for me is 96. I just rewatched that recently and I'm like, mm, yeah, there's a reason I didn't like you very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. The 2020 movie is my second, uh, personally. And then same, poor 96 Emma is is wow. in last place. Oh, Jenica, I feel like okay. there's disagreement coming and I'm so- Yes, excited. I I have to disagree with you guys. I do, th I think 96 is the best. I oh, loved no. it. It's yes. so prepared. Oh my God. Oh, okay. oh my God. And like, I think 2009 or was it 2006? I forget now the year. Nine. 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 Nine is my second and 2020 for me, like I couldn't, I'm sorry, I just didn't like wrong. it. Wrong. <laughs> it's okay, you can be wrong, it's fine. <laughs> well, no, it's yeah, I just like, like I love the, debate. Uh, uh, yes, it will be a polite Austin-like debate. Austin but fans were very polite. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I know we have strong opinions as most Austin fans do, but like um, for me, 96 just has the most like, fun tone. I love the romance. I love the, um, you know, there's some nostalgia there because I'm sure I saw it when I was young, a young teen, you know, teen probably. And um, I just, I don't know. I enjoy like everything about it practically, except for like, it is slightly camp and I, I can recognize that. But, um, and then 2009, I think is really good because it's extended, you know, you get all these threads that can't fit into a feature film. Um, and so you got like so much more of the book in, two, in the 2009 miniseries. And yeah, so that's where I stand. So I think we'll have some interesting things to say. <laughs> you might not like what we have to say about Gwyneth Paltrow. It's going to be me. Well, okay, no, I will say, I think Gwyneth Paltrow, Gwyneth Paltrow's not my favorite in it. All right. Like, okay. um, I remember like when back then, you know, there was the two versions, it was like the Kate Beckinsale version, which we're not really talking about today, but like, um, 
I always wanted it. I always wish that Kate Beckinsale had been in that movie. And mm -hmm. I mean, like, I don't know if it would have worked like tonally necessarily, but um, I always liked her better. So. Okay. Well, and uh, we might as well share the only reason we're not including the Beckinsale in this is it's the hardest to get a hold of on streaming. Yeah. That is why for some yeah. reason they've decided not to capitalize on Emma and it is only available for purchase for, I think it, I think it was over $10 and I noped right out of that. And I figured most people wouldn't be into that. So a lot of people, when we did our polls, which we were about to talk about, we're right. shouting that movie out though. A ton of people, that's their favorite version. So. I, it has its merits. I mean, I, I wish we could have. I wish it was easier to access. For and people. that's the thing. I haven't seen it because it never, or it hasn't landed on free streaming uh, at any time that I've noticed. And I guess I'm really cheap. So. <laughs> it's good. It is, I mean, it's cheap. Good. Yeah, cheap's are good. Well, cheap's cheap's good. good. I mean, I think in this time, in this climate, it's okay. Yeah. You know, right? Well, it's, it's mostly that the, we've all seen 96 because we're of an age of what yeah. like we yeah. i probably saw it in the theater we probably saw it in the theater or on hbo like it accessibility matters i actually think that the only reason 2009 also works so well is that it's accessible in a good way it's been on multiple stream platforms consistently since its release which is not the case with 2006 jane Eyre, which is why it is underappreciated i actually agree with that i think that's very true it's finally on uh, 2006 jane Eyre is finally available i believe on masterpiece thank you yay Yay. Took forever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so tell us. Okay, tell us what your poll said, Alexa. You did a yeah. Twitter poll. I did an Instagram poll. So I did a Twitter and a YouTube oh, poll, right. and I honestly was genuinely surprised by the results. Jesse will not be, but I I didn't expect the new movie to win both polls, but it did. Uh, I didn't realize that many people had seen it. I thought it was so super divisive. Obviously, I did like it, but I thought more people would hate it. Uh, but on the YouTube poll, which 314 people took, 48% said that 2020 was their favorite. Uh, 2009 came in second at 26%, 96 at 25 So those no. were like neck and neck. I'll also be fair and say that even though it's the correct choice, I'll also be fair and say that generally speaking, the stuff that's whatever an adaptation is like newer, you're going to have yeah. more people having just seen it, more people having fresh reactions. So that yeah. could be biasing. But I maintain that in 10 years time, it will still be the correct answer. I do think it'll stand the test of time. I, I think it, it's it's a really interesting film, which we're going to talk about. And then the Twitter poll, 43% out of 123 prefer 2020. Uh, 2009 was 34% and 96 was 22. Uh, but some, some 96 stands definitely were not pleased with those poll results on Twitter. I did see Yeah, them. I saw those people. Your people. I, was, I was like, yay, there's my people. <laughs> but yeah, no, on my poll on Instagram, which is far more informal than yours, uh, my, uh, let's see, I think 2009 and 96 actually tied. And then um, 2000, the new one had like only a few people for hmm. some reason. Uh, but I didn't do, I didn't do percentages. Cause yeah, it was either like differences in, in, in uh, subscriber bases or Instagram. Instagram is just full of Gwyneth Paltrow stands. It's one or the other. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I actually, actually, well, initially they loved it. the the Romola one, and then yeah. it was winning, and then it, and then yeah. like at the last minute, someone had a, enough to like make them tie. So, cool. yeah. Well, and I feel like your your audience because your book is like real Austin Meta, like legit, and you you're a historical yeah. fiction writer. Like I was, mm. I knew that the, the hardcore stands would be on Instagram, and that we'd probably get a different <laughs> result there. <laughs> Right. I, I'm still really shocked by the results. I just didn't know that many people had seen the new movie because it was such a limited release. Like Jesse and I yeah. got to see it because we are spoiled and live in Los Angeles yes. where we get all the limited releases first. But then they did the straight to uh, VOD premiere thing. So right. I guess that's, that's how I saw it. How, that's how my family saw it. My, my, my parents saw it back in Jersey. My sister saw it and her husband and uh, Good. they all loved it. Yeah. So, but it, but yeah, so thank God that they did that because otherwise it really would have just slunk, slunk away. And, I'm glad it didn't. and this, I mean, my the company I work for made that movie, so go <laughs> me. Not me, literally. I do not work for the movie. Thank so you for making the entire movie. But like, you thank you for making money for my company and <laughs> working a hard time. Anyway. Um, so do we... So want to like we're, we're gonna casting or, yeah, we're gonna or something else break them each down and really compare the different merits of the different adaptations so okay yeah um so let's start with 
the Emma, I guess, or each mm -hmm. Emma. And since I guess maybe we should do like, since each one of us loves a different one, like maybe we should talk about the merits of each of the one we love. I don't know. Okay. Although, I, I actually, you, think you, did, you don't love your Emma unconditionally. Well, that's true. That's true. Well, do, do any of us love Gwyneth Paltrow? And I don't think any of us does. No. Okay, there I you go. Best so, Emma, no. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm just going to jump in. I think okay, that, all right, I have an enormous fondness for Rommel Garay Gar in this room. I don't know if I'm saying that name right. I'm sorry. Um, but I really do. I think that she does an excellent job in the role. Um, and she, of all of them, gives Emma, to me, the most human dimension, which is something that I find very likable about her. But if we're going by which of these actresses do I see as the Emma that I see, saw in my mind when I was reading Jane Austen, it's Anya Taylor-Joy. Because she, and this is kind of the same thing for me for the whole adaptation, is that I personally think Jane Austen's hard to do in terms tonally and people, they tend to either err on the side of making it swooningly romantic, like the 96 one, or the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, which I have a lot of thoughts on, or they, they make it just, a, or, or it's just, they make it too informal, they make you search. But what I liked about the 2020 one was that these are very human characters and they, you can feel that there's human blood inside of them, but it's still a very hierarchical, rigid, structured world. And I thought that Anya Taylor-Joy did a really good job of sort of portraying the combination of humanity and also starchiness. Not to mention also that quite frankly, she's the only one of them. I mean, she's the closest one of all of them. They were all in their twenties when they made their adaptations, but I think she's the closest in terms of age to the actual Emma. So that does help. I looked it up. Okay. Uh, she is now the same age that Gwyneth was when her movie came out. So they arguably were the same age when they made it. Wow. I think Gwyneth was just always kind of a chilly 40 year old, even <laughs> yeah. at 24. Whereas Anya was literally playing a teenager as recently as her last movie. So I, I think okay. that she feels younger to us because she still plays teens. But mm -hmm. I agree. She felt the the most convincingly 21 to me. Yeah. Uh, that said, I have to give Ramala credit. I was shocked to find out she was the oldest Emma. She was 26. Cause I didn't, she didn't read 26 in it to me. She kind of has this like petulant teenageness to her in some of yeah. the critical scenes that I thought she, she did really, really well. Like some of her like meltdowns were just beautifully done where you're like, she is a spoiled brat but she has so much humanity and I still really love her and relate to her, but my God, <laughs> at least I, I, let, I feel she did that well. And especially cause they actually did like a, a seeing Emma grow up montage in that movie. And the movie generally right. we'll talk about has a lot more of the past in it than the other mm. ones do. And Romola briefly plays Emma at like 14. Yes. And it's insane that she did that as a 26 year old, but I bought it. She was like really silly and teenagery in that brief. It's like a two minute yeah. scene. Yeah. And then when she's the adult Emma. I was like, oh, but she still retained some of that character. So she did some good character work. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. I would agree with that too. I think she she felt young because I, I, as I was rewatching it a couple of days ago, I was like, okay, I think she feels so young or she's you know, gives the impression of being young because she's like constantly kind of like running around and like doing little cutesy things. And uh, so, you know, it gives the impression that she's younger. And then um, I do like that they dealt with Emma's childhood, which mm -hmm. of course is not in any other version. I think, I'm not even sure if it's in the book. I, I, don't, I don't I think like that it is not. actually, I think that there is oh, okay. a scene early on, like it, in, in the way that there are scenes in Jane Austen, it's everything just kind of flows into one scene after the other. But yeah, I think that there are actually depictions of her, again, very, very briefly, but I think so. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think she did a good job there. And it was interesting to see, I mean, we can talk about this later too, but like, I think, well, actually it plays into what we, I, I want to talk about next, which is Nightly and like the castings for Nightly. But um, like, I think the relationship between Emma and Nightly and their friendship is like super crucial to the plot and and to just like the character development. And so in that one, in the 2009, we see the two of them when, or when she's a child and he's, you know, I guess a teenager, although he still looks like he's in his twenties or thirties, but regardless, um, you know, um, <laughs> right. um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I like that they are able to show the, like their relationship early on and how it 
plays out is clearly, you know, clearly delineated in that mini series. Um, yeah. I guess we can talk about him, about Knightley's now, if you guys want. Um, well, in combination with Gwyneth, because okay, I, I guess I, I, I really talk about Gwyneth, But I will also briefly say one thing I will agree with Jesse that I loved about 2020. It's one of my favorite things, but it is a big choice. And I think it's a big choice that is the reason a lot of people dislike it. We could talk about it more later. But they made the choice to make Emma a real teenage character even though she's 21 they really go into like she is sheltered and it's essentially emotionally stunted she's going to go on a journey so in the beginning she is going to be kind of a huge brat and i agree with you jesse like just from a sheer performance perspective what anya taylor joy was able to do i was impressed because from where she starts to where she ends was pretty incredibly done yeah like i I fully was invested in that arc, even if it felt a little unfamiliar, because she's the harshest Emma, basically. Yeah. Who goes on the <laughs> biggest journey. Yeah. And honestly, that's why I liked her so much. It's exact like when you see when I one thing I really liked about the 2020 is that you start off, she's going to Miss Taylor's wedding. You see her in her finery sitting in the chapel. And then you see her a year later at the end of the movie at her own wedding. And it really and truly does feel, you know, it's the same person, but you can tell that she's really changed as opposed to the other two, which kind of felt like shenanigans ensue. And then, oh, there's the happy ending. And, mm -hmm. there, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that I really liked the fact that 2020 was such a journey emotionally. Yeah, um, that's so interesting because like, cause, like yeah. I did not... I did not get that. Like for me, she was so unlikable at the beginning. <laughs> and then like, I didn't feel her like growing as a character. And I mean, I know they were, I, I don't know. I obviously this is a perception thing, but like, I, I just didn't see it happen. I didn't see the progression and I didn't see her like getting any better. I didn't see her like, making any progress towards being like a, a nicer human i don't know maybe that's just me because like no. i'm i'm less inclined to like not likable characters you know? cool. I, I don't know that, you, you know what i'd say um is that actually just to quickly as i'm derailing everything i apologize but like just to quickly bring in like the box hill thing so to me, another very seminal piece in in emma is the box hill scene where she insults miss bates and yeah what I liked about the 2020 that I didn't see in the 96 or the 2009 in the 90, I mean, I forget exactly how Knightley reprimands her in 96, but she really has this kind of queen bitch ice frost thing when she just kind of slams Miss Bates in a way that's like, she does. Oh man, you knew what you were doing and that sucks. Yeah. And the 2000, yeah. In the 2009 one, she really doesn't, she seems kind yeah. of oblivious to it in the 2020 one. She laughingly says, oh, but you know, something like you you have so much more than three dull things to say and just boom. And you can see her realize what she's just done. And mm -hmm. you and so when Knightley comes to get her, he doesn't really have to convince her that she did anything wrong. She already knows that she fucked up so in the 2021. And so when he comes along and just kind of lays into her, you see her just starting to break down because you can see her realizing like, I know that I did this. I know what I did was awful. And she just burst into tears in the carriage ride home. And to me, that just felt like that's the moment when, when you take a look at yourself and you're like, I'm not the person I thought that I might've been. I'm not as good and as nice as I thought I might have been. And it's that shock of that moment. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what I saw personally. That's fair. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. I, yeah, I, I did note, I re I rewatched the 96 one last night. Like I kind of skimmed, but cause I've seen it a hundred times, but like um, that scene in particular, I was like, wow, she is like the bitchiest of them all when she is mean to Miss Bates. And um, and like you said, she does it knowingly. Like you can tell from that look. And yeah. and then, you know, and she doesn't even try to give, like laugh it off or anything. They all just kind of stare at her like, oh. Um, and then, but I do think he reprimands her quite well. You know, he, he, go, he actually goes for it. Jeremy North does. Badly done, his, Emma. Oh, yeah, like he, Jeremy he North really great, goes. By the way. Like he's, well. He is, yeah. Okay, he's great. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, that's interesting. So I think, yeah, Alex, what were you gonna say? Well, I think we should talk about one F, which will take us into Nightly's, cause I love Northam a lot and I, I think in hindsight, he carries that movie for me 
romantically. Yeah. Because in hindsight, I have problems with Gwyneth Paltrow, but it could just be that we've grown to know her in such a different way. Yeah, that's true. But he, he is fantastic. I mean, I can't quarrel too much with any of the Knightleys, to be no, fair. No, they're all good. They're all good. Uh, so let's talk about Gwyneth uh, as Emma. Okay. Um, <laughs> Accent? <laughs> Shall we go there? <laughs> I mean. Sometimes it's good and sometimes I'm like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, she gets I, away with it sometimes, but I, always. Okay, I remember back, uh, you know, in the late 90s, early aughts, when Gwyneth Paltrow, A, was around a lot more, and B, was doing a lot more movies where she had to do a British accent. And I saw a lot of people, like, sometimes a lot of critics saying, like, man, Gwyneth Paltrow is an American who can do a really great British accent. I'm like, really? She's <laughs> a very particular kind of a uh, British accent. It's, it's a particular kind <laughs> of... Lucky and wealthy. It, it's like... Hello, I do the received pronunciation for all the parts in my drama school, even when it's, you know, Oliver Twist and I'm supposed to be Fagin. It's that kind of shit. You know, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Just see, we, this video won't be for kids now because there's cursing. I'm kidding. We can't, we can't get, like, ads on this now because of my filthy mouth. I no, they just limit the ads. They're just, they're, it's a whole thing. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, oh, Gwyneth. Um, I feel like Emma was perfect casting for her, but I don't mean that as a compliment, really. <laughs> right. I think her growth arc is difficult because the undercurrent of snobbishness in her is the actress. It's not the character. And again, I do think it's hindsight. I watch it now and I'm just like, God, she's going to found goop. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it is depressing. Like I, I can't watch uh, Shakespeare in Love anymore with that, with that in my head too. Like it's so sad. Yeah. Um, Thankfully, I never liked that movie. I was a very okay. edgy fourteen-year-old, and I well, I am still nursing the pain of her stealing an Oscar from Kate Blanchett. I am still upset. Yes, thank you. Never forget. Elizabeth, nope. superior film should have also been Best Picture. Thank you. Same, same so. reason I also have a problem with Roberto Benigni for taking Ian McKellen's Oscar for Gods and Monsters. Never get over oh. that. Oh, that was a good movie. This is white privilege right here, folks. This is what it is. It's the people being angry and salty about Oscars 20 years later. <laughs> 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 Things that don't matter. Although I'm also still mad about Kate Winslet and Sense of Sensibility, which is also J Jane Austen related. So, yeah. Wow. True. Yeah, no, I think ugh, Gwyneth. Gwyneth, tough, Gwyneth, Gwyneth. But yeah, I mean, because she's you, like you can't remove her from her persona. It's like a Tom. It's like Tom Cruise now. It's like you yeah. can't remove it. So, but at uh, the time, like it was problem. fine. And and I know we're gonna talk more about movie tone, but it works very well as basically a romantic comedy that is historical. And she was good in it. Yes. Just we're comparing her to other people we like more personally. Yeah. Jenica, you feelings. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I don't love her. And I, so I wouldn't, I'm not going to sit here and defend her necessarily. I just think I just love that movie better. That's all, I guess, as a whole. And like, and I do think, okay, so there is one scene that they include in that movie and where she goes and like uh, helps a poor old lady who's sick, you know, and like, they don't, do that in either of the other and adaptations. I, I, I actually I noticed that, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a choice. It's definitely a character choice. I, I mean, I mean, probably it's like helpful for you to be like to get on board with her. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's they do other stuff like that where you're like, oh, she's awful, and then she'll do something that you're like, okay, she's not that bad. And um, I agree. Also in the 96 one, I think that part of the reason that she does, you see her with the old lady, is that Harriet Smith is standing there not knowing what to do, and then she tries to. Right get Mr. Elton and Harriet together by passing off her good deeds as Harriet's. But I, I absolutely agree that I was sitting there watching it going, this feels like it's very deliberately placed here. Yeah. Like it's the nineties. Yeah. We can't allow women to be too unlikable. They have to. <laughs> yeah, that's very possible. I mean, but it's interesting that they didn't include that in the other two versions. Like, well, I mean, I forget about the 2009 one. I do know that in the 2020 one, I remember she, after, that box hill, she takes a basket to Miss Bates. Uh, and you can right. tell that this is, because this is something that a woman of her station would have done 
frequently. And I forget, so you definitely see that. I don't remember how much charity you see Rommel Gary doing. Um, um, there's only like one spot yeah. where she and Harriet are carrying baskets. They don't say where they're going. Right. And it's like not explained. Yeah. So I don't know. It's odd. But I agree. Yeah. That was one thing I did like about the 96 one was that it did actually show this is something a noble woman, a gentlewoman would have done. She would have taken baskets to the sick yeah. um, and, and fed soup and things like that. And the puppies. And puppies. There were puppies. Yeah, the puppies. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, for, at least for 1996, what saves her for me, even in hindsight, is that I think Jeremy Northam is just dreamy as yeah. Mr. Knightley. And yeah. like, like you feel his warmness. Their friendship scenes are funny and cute. I, it, it's literally a, a historical yeah. rom com, and it's a very effective one. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, I know it's not your favorite proposal scene, Jesse, but it. I, I don't know. I, I like them all for different reasons. I was about well, to say like it's not like it's he's my favorite. favorite nightly in the proposal scene. I think it's is the fair. way to put it. I, uh, I I do think it's like if you just pretend that Gwyneth Paltrow isn't receiving the proposal, if it's like you or something, you're like, yes, this is the best adaptation ever. <laughs> that's true. I mean, and that's doable because they constantly are like doing close-ups yeah. on him. So you can do that. You like, can absolutely make, wrong with that. make your own dreams come true. Um, yeah. I, I'm gonna, I, um, I think I like, in terms of the proposal scene itself, I think I like the 2009 ver version the best. Because I really feel, I like the fact that she's just so heartbroken until she realizes he's talking about her and how he's just so nervous about it. And it really does kind of feel like two people who've known each other for decades suddenly figuring this out. Um, whereas I love the 96 one for the Swoony romance, but again, being a person who likes, who knows like Austin was such a catty, wonderful bitch in some ways, um, it's, it's almost a little too Swoony. And then the, 2000, the 2020 one, I really like, and actually one thing I like, one thing I think about the 2020 version, the Knightley and Emma dynamic, is even though I know that the actors are like 13 years apart in age, they feel like they're the same age in some ways. And that's both a benefit and it's 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 a detriment. And I kind of felt both in the proposal scene for the 2021, because it just, it, it felt like they're basically still a couple of kids. And you know that Knightley's supposed to be 37 or so or something like that he's supposed to be much older yeah. and that dynamic felt a little bit strange anyway so but, strange yeah. to think of that as older we, well, we are officially austin aging one oh, no. <laughs> colonel brandon slash 30 slash mr knightley it was very specific it is very specific in persuasion that they're like Anne is 27 20 20. Shocking. <laughs> it's a oh, nightmare. Right. How how will her That's ovaries so not cease to function? She's 27. <laughs> yes. Like, so it's we, when the Austin watcher who is over the age of 25 needs to remember that this has to be seen in the context of it's 1817. So yeah, and yet relating to Mrs. Miss Bates is still a a weird place to be. <laughs> <laughs> This is so true. I want to be Emma, Gosh. but I can't anymore. I'm I'm too now in Miss Bates. I am um, <laughs> yeah, no. I am nightly. <laughs> but I would not marry a 21 year old. So yeah. Different yeah. times. Different times. Uh so can we talk about the nosebleed while we're talking about this? Because I know people have brought it up with me. Some people are bringing it up in the comments. I'm like, people bring it up with me, and I'm like, I didn't like it. They they tell me they are confused by it or they don't like it. And I'm just like, I'm not sure what the point of it was. So maybe you guys have some insight into that. Cause I don't. It, at least the way I read about it, it was literally just a real thing that happened. And yeah. they thought it was funny. Oh. And so they no. used that take. She got a nosebleed while they were yeah. filming. What I read, oh they were actually planning to do a nosebleed. So what they were going to do was they were going to shoot the thing. They were going to cut away. They're going to put some makeup on her and then they're going to cut back. And I guess she like either serendipitously or it's like her secret party trick. She like got a nosebleed when they needed her to have a nosebleed. So huh. then it was planned. I mean, it's it's a choice. Mm -hmm. I don't hate it the way that some people do, but it does. I mean, but in fairness, the entire 2020 movie is satirically hilarious. Yeah. So interrupting the proposal scene with something ridiculous didn't throw me. 
if the movie had had a different tone all along, maybe, but I also like, I have to think of them separately. Like the 96 one is the Sunni ridiculous romantic one. And right. the 2009 one is where I really feel like Romulan nailed it. Like you feel all of her emotions and you're like on the edge of your seat. And then the 2021 is the one where you burst out laughing. Cause it's, ridiculous and look at these dumb teenagers even though they're not literally teenagers but it feels like YA and that's yeah exactly. so yeah yeah it's ridiculous she's like oh it's I, I think it's funny but I get why people hate it because it, well, it, it's shocking when it's, it's, it's just because it's like it's not romantic I feel yeah. like and I think that's why right. most people or the people I've spoken to don't like it I, but, I, you know it, and you know and I'm someone who will maintain to my dying breath as people beat me with their cost copies of like Emma, that uh, Austin isn't meant to be swooningly romantic, but I will concede as much as I love the 2021. And I personally, because I'm a gremlin, do love the idea of getting a nosebleed in the middle of a romantic proposal. I also, <laughs> I also acknowledge that um, it's not, it's almost a little too jarring. And I, I love the fact, I love a lot of the comedy in that movie. I love Mr. Woodhouse needing eight million screens for the fire. Yeah. I love so I much. I thought that was fine. Just, just the good timing of it. And I still do enjoy the nosebleed moment. It just, it does perhaps devolve a little bit much into just shouting at each other and then she's running away. And I can't understand people being like, this was the, this was the moment, man. This was supposed to be the romantic moment. And, and now it's nosebleeds. Like I, I, I see yeah. both sides. I, I suppose I say. Okay. Um, do we want to talk about Johnny Lee Miller and Johnny Flynn? Because why not cast men who have the same name to pay <laughs> characters? Um, I Johnny Lee Miller is probably my ultimate, but that's just because I adore him as an Austin hero. Because I he's also my favorite. Well, not favorite part of Mansfield Park. That movie's just good. But like he's the only Edmund who could sell me on marrying your cousin. So I also <laughs> love him as Mr. Knightley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think he does. I think he did it, does a great job in the 2009 in the Emma and in both movies actually. In both movies he's in, but like um, he does a great job. Like I, I think I, I, I sent you a message, Alexa, when I was watching it because at one point, oh, it's the scene where he and Emma are talking about um, uh, how Harriet has turned down Robert Martin's proposal, right? And he's like his expressions when she was telling him her opinions about Robert Martin were just like priceless. And also uh, like, just like, it was like he had thought this stuff out, like all the little bits of business, clearly he was thinking like what he needed to do and like, and it comes out on screen and like, you can, you know, and he's like, obviously like a more, I feel like he's more thinking nightly, like mm. the Northam possibly, but that's also cause he has more screen time. To, to yeah. show us, you know. Yeah. also so yeah. dreamy. I remember when I was a teen, I was like, how is this man not married? Like, no. <laughs> or at least John Lee Miller, I'm like, he has like a quiet vulnerability where I'm like, okay, he's hermited, he's an introvert, he is in love with Emma. Yeah, that's a good point. I buy it. That's okay, point. fine. Yeah, I and then that, Johnny yeah. Lynn, like, I didn't, I didn't dislike his nightly, but like, he's a rock star, like literally in real life. It, I actually felt the entire 2020 movie, it was like rock star casting. We'll talk about Frank Churchill. Spoiler, I hated yeah. it. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Frank it's Churchill. One, uh, it's one of, mm -mm, anyway. Uh, but I liked all the glimpses of Knightley, like a little nudity, okay, you're sure. Um, I was down with that, that was okay with me. But actually because Anya Taylor-Joy still looks like a teenager, and he is our age, just chew on that. So he's properly an adult man in his mid to late thirties. He felt, I, I didn't feel like they were really friends in a lot of it. Like I really felt like he right. was like, brothering her, which is how it's supposed to be, but it was still very strange. No, uh, yeah, I hear that. Yeah, it's- like, I, I rewatched the uh, Campbell party scene. Uh, I think it's the Campbells. Uh, after she's played and Jane is playing and he's like teasing her and he's actually quite mean. <laughs> her in that scene in a way that he's not mean in the other ones he's like being complimentary and you know why she misinterprets it but in the 2020 one i was like there's no misinterpretation here he's dissing her like oh. he oh yeah you should be watching oh, it yeah. on youtube and i love the 20 i i actually there's a thing about that scene i want to talk about in the 2020 that i love but i still like specific to nightly was like he's weirdly he's he's actually kind of mean to her yeah, it's like, okay, so classic Neg, you know, he he knows 
He knows how to get the ladies excited. Um, okay, so my personal <laughs> feeling of the nightly, just quickly ranking them, I actually think that in terms of uh, the, the nightly that I could see sort of most from the book, it would be either Jeremy Northam or Johnny Lee Miller. Um, I personally really like uh, Johnny Flynn. That's his name, right? The, the guy in the 2020. Yeah. Uh, I, I So many J's. Everyone's got a J name. I don't know. <laughs> Um, That's true. They all do. But my God, but uh, but you know, I I he's my brand of snarky friend who realizes I like you. But mm -hmm. I don't think that he is. I don't think he's like what I would put in the quintessential Austin adaptation of Emma. Mm -hmm. That would be more the other right. two. That's what yeah. I really like the scene where he gets so flustered that he lies on the floor. That was nice. I, I was like, that was a mood. Yeah, <laughs> that was. Yeah, I mean, like, like me, I thought, like, oh god, my emotions. Oh god, my emotions. The furniture. I just, I can't, the floor. furniture can't contain my emotions, and then just lie down. Yeah. I also. Yeah, I mean, it's cute. I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. It's like, like you say, it's not the nightly I have in my head. I guess the guy who like lies down on the floor because he's so overcome. I don't know. That's just right. But um, but and like I, the scene. Oh yeah, I, and I will say, Alexa, like I felt like they their friendship is not established at the beginning of the movie and it's just kind of like he's there he's not like but she doesn't seem to have much they don't have seen how much have to have much of an affinity for each other at the beginning of the movie and so like for me that was a, a barrier i guess yeah but i also just genuinely appreciated the realism that i believed their age gap i, ha yeah, I haven't no, ever really I believed the age gap before but does that make it good or bad that you believe the age gap because then you start to really think about Austin age gaps and you go, oh yeah, like, yeah. It's like there's the normal ones like Frederick Wentworth and Anne Elliot, yeah, even Darcy and Elizabeth. There's like six, seven years. That's, that's okay. That's okay. But like, but Colonel Brandon, Brandon, but and lightly, I'm like, then I remember she's 17, and then I go, oh, because yeah. uh, I think about yeah. me, I'm that age and. Ew, children, children, <laughs> I would be arrested. Oh, oh. Yeah. Anyway, I'm fine. I know it was a different time, but still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. I mean, like in that, like because of that, I feel like it's almost nice when the age gap isn't that obvious. Honestly, <laughs> that's kind of one of the reasons, even though I wouldn't say Johnny Flynn's my perfect nightly, one of the reasons I kind of liked the uh, the 2020 was that to be honest with you, the 16 year old gauge gap has always squicked me out a little bit. I, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I, I know that very successful yeah. marriages have been made with an age gap like that or larger. I am not dissing that. It's just there's something about it between these two characters. I don't know. It's just always bothered me a little bit in this particular context. And uh, so having a situation where I could just kind of imagine they were just a little closer in age. Uh, which actually, kind of are, which is good. It was a lot less awkward for me, to be honest. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and just I generally, the casting was very age modern. Age. Sorry. Oh, I think we're all on the same page about the age guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think. <laughs> generally, maybe we cap off casting here, uh, like move into some of the secondary characters. But it's interesting because yeah. I feel like the casting in '96 was very modern for '96. Interesting choices. And I feel the same way about 2020 and it'll be interesting to see how it ages. Cause they essentially, they caught, they cast Anya Taylor joy who played her like a gen Z teenager. And they cast Johnny Flynn, who is basically a millennial, like arrested development millennial. That's how he felt. You're right. He's a 36 year old man who felt like he was 25 yeah. and like maybe not fully like, like emotionally mature. Like you said, and I really relate to that. <laughs> and let's talk about Frank Churchill, because oh, okay, the one thing I can say I passionately hated about the new movie, like, pa like, like, yeah, mm, hated him. Yeah, I, I actually agree. With you. I think that they did Frank Douche Churchill. They, they, they did him dirty in the 2020 adaptation. Yeah. And the guy who plays him also, I think I remember, uh, was um, the, 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 the creepy guy. Karag I can't remember his name. Was it Karagan in War and Peace? He's the guy who tries to get Natasha to run away with him and he's just weaselly and awful and just I can't remember his name because it's right I, someone I has a comment, the comment. Yeah. Oh, yeah he was Prince Anatoly yes Prince Anatoly. Anatoly. thank you thank you commenter yes that's exactly it thank you so much um but yes uh I, I I thought he was good in that part I think he's a good actor but I thought he was good in the yeah. 
Yeah. And I fell apart because that's what the character's supposed to be. But I feel like they went, what if we just did that in for Frank Churchill? I'm like, maybe for maybe for Willoughby, I could see this for Wickham, but Frank yeah. Churchill isn't, he, he's in the vein of those particular types yeah. of men, but he's a little bit better than they are. Yeah, so, he's yeah. not Agreed. He's not a 100% fuck boy, basically. Yeah. But that's how they cast him. And I was yeah. like, because like Frank Churchill and Jane, for that matter, are such conflicting characters, meaning how an adaptation chooses to portray them and their relation to Emma changes how you feel. Like my big thing with 96, like even as like a teen, before I understood anything about Jane Austen, I was so conflicted about Frank Churchill because Ewan McGregor was so hot and so charming and flirtatious. Except the like, hair. <laughs> the hair. The hair's a thing, yeah. But then he's such a dick. And I hated what he did so much that I was like, wait, I feel terrible. Am I supposed to? I was conflicted is my point. I felt less conflicted about how it was done in 2009. I think they kind of walked the line. But did it feel that way because we see their childhood? Which I is think, a choice that made. I think the, the Frank Churchill of 2009 is the best one because yeah. I think that he's handled the best. Like, yeah. I really he's do think. Real that that scene right right after the revelation to Emma that, oh my God, they're actually engaged, Jane and Frank are engaged. And then you see them both like running excitedly to each other in the street and he's just, you can tell he's so happy that finally he's out in the open. That is a really important scene to be, it, again, you don't you don't condone what he did, yeah. but, but it helps you understand the emotional impact and you can understand maybe why he was doing what he was doing and how now he's gonna finally get it all together and like, good for you, Jane. Well, and also yeah. Jane was well developed in the 2009 as well, which helps. Yeah, she like, is. She know her. Developed. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, what struck me is that the so I watched the 09 first this week, and then I was struck by how much he puts Jane down to Emma. Like, and I know that's all in the book. I, I think it is anyway. And like, it is. Yeah, I read yeah, it. So it's not like they didn't make it I, up. I was but, like, was it like this? But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, but there's so much of it. Like he's it's like almost every time he sees Emma, he says something mean about Jane Fairfax. And I was just like, what the heck is up with this? Like, he's really hard for me to like. And then in that version, because of it, even with the like the end, like happy scene, oh yeah, we've yeah. you know figured it out. Like, I just I can't get behind that guy. And then the Ewan in '96, like I went back because I wanted to see how many times he puts down Jane. He doesn't, not once. Like they cut that stuff out. So like, mm -hmm. right. I was, I was looking, I was looking and like, he, he's just constantly like trying to get Emma to like go for this red herring about Mr. Dixon, right? Like yeah. Mr. she and Mr. Dixon have a thing. And like, that's all he does. And then like, he keeps constantly like looking for Jane Fairfax. So it's not even really like a s surprise, I think right. much. And I mean, if you read the book, obviously it's not a surprise, but like, right. it's less of a surprise to, the audience yeah. because he hasn't been so weird. I don't know, that that was just for me, but I don't know. I think it's interesting. And then like 2020, he's like the worst of the three. <laughs> they made him look a Wickham character. He's not a Wickham character. Yeah. The point like, is that he looks like a Wickham character, but he's not like. Well, but at least yeah. in like the other two, uh, I with you and I would argue, even if he doesn't put Jane down, he flirts hardcore with Gwyneth. Yeah. Like, you believe why like uh, they didn't I was know. looking but I didn't see it I swear he's like it was so cute so it's he's beautiful Jenica he's a beautiful, he's so beautiful. Man. oh my god and, he's, and when he sings with her I felt things I was like oh <laughs> an angel an angel uh, in 2009 like he's flirty sometimes but I didn't feel like he was egregiously flirty you are correct he's more like mean about Jane than outwardly yeah. like horribly flirty and I don't even remember how flirty he was in 2020 because I just disliked him so much. Because the thing is, the other two is, you at least understand why she wants to be friends with Frank Churchill. Yeah. We talked up her whole life. Mr. Weston really loves him. But in the new one, it's like, why would you even talk to this dick face? Like, why? Right. Why? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get it. But one of my favorite choices 2020 made, even though it is completely not canon, but I loved it. Jane's a bitch in the new one. And I love it. She is catty. Uh, watch the piano scene, which you can on YouTube. I rewatched it. Emma's not very good at the piano or singing. She's fine, but she's not very good. And then Jane, she makes a 
face while Emma's playing, indicating she thinks she's bad. And then she purposefully shows her up. And I thought it was like, I love that rivalry. Not in the book. It doesn't go down that way in the book. Right. But I was just glad that they were willing to really kind of. They were giving everyone a little bit of the old. Uh, jerk it was back. funny. It was, yeah. it was funny, but also like it was a moment where I felt this profound sense of that Emma in the 2020 Emma, how essentially isolated and lonely she was and yeah. how she basically yeah. was a big fish in a very small pond mm -hmm. and it made me feel bad for her i i felt feelings i liked that scene even though that's not really the emotion that exists on the page i went back and reread that scene it, it is implied that jane's a little better than she is but it's not like a smack in the face i thought it was good yeah i liked it i thought Gwyneth Paltrow was a little too talented honestly i think that they <laughs> No, I, I think that there was no way they were going to have Gwyneth Paltrow not be good at playing the piano and singing. Yeah, true. I mean, still, she is not as good as Jane Fairfax is in that thing. Like, you Unless know, she's, she's doing a kind of folksy song. Too much vibrato, so. Oh, who, Jane Fairfax or? Jane Fairfax, I'm picky. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Singing to personal, the so I'm glad that the new Jane just, like, played a ridiculous concerto. She's like, yeah, no, that was fun. Yeah. That was funny. I like mm -hmm. that. But yeah, it made me laugh because she was a catty bitch. So, but frankly, therefore, she deserved Frank Churchill, who we hate. So, <laughs> there you go. Those are my favorite. All right. Yeah. Let's see. Should we talk about? Um, well, we kind of brought this up, but like uh, Bill Nye in the in the new one and all his fire screens. I did That's think favorite. that was amusing, and you know, like that was the part I liked him. I thought he was the best. Part. Bill Nye is the best Mr. Woodhouse. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, the one in the in the 96, like I don't even know that actor's name. They just like and essentially 96, they're both movies, and they had to make uh 2020s a little longer, so they had a little more runtime. But anytime you have a movie, they have to downplay That's some stuff. things, yeah. up play other things. And the 96 movie, like the dad was just less important in that one. So it's just a choice they made. Whereas in the new one, it was like Yeah, but even like, just him. Just, just, just Bill Nye just sitting there with his like sour little puss grin. It was like, and, and the, the the psychotically anxious older sister. Oh my god! Bella, I was like, and then the, her playing off the dad. I was dying laughing. I was like, and then you just imagine Emma growing up in that household, and it actually explains everything about the Anya Taylor Joy interpretation of the character. Yes, I actually, I that's good thing you said that. I actually thought that the way that the characters everyone is portraying their role the way everyone in the 2020 plays their role does a lot to help tell the story of why things are the way that they are in a way that I felt that the acting didn't quite do that much of a job in the other. I mean, don't get me wrong. The acting's fine in all the adaptations. It's just that, like you said, the particular choices that the, the actors made and with help from the director helped to add in almost a backstory that didn't need to be explained in words. Kind of like you said, and I really liked that about it. I am curious what we all think about Harriet because I feel like she is a potentially divisive character, meaning how an adaptation, what they choose to do with her, because she yeah. can be very annoying. And I'm curious uh, if we have feelings. I really liked Mia Goth. I think that's her name. I really thought that she did a great job. I also loved Toni Collette. I mean, I love Toni Collette and everything. Toni Collette's a wonderful actress, can do no wrong. Um, and I thought that she was doing a very good job within the idea of what that kind of movie was back in the nineties. It was a bit more twee, the adaptation, it was a bit more, it, it's, it's England has never, never looked so sunny or so pretty, you know, everything is pretty right. and funny. And within the context of that, she did a very good job, but I really liked Mia Goth because I'm actually a big fan of hers. She's in Suspiria, which is one of my favorite horror movies. She's just a really fantastic understated actress in a lot of ways. And so I thought that she really kind of brought this, element to Harriet where simultaneously you want to hug her and you want to shake her and normally it's one or the other and mm -hmm. I liked yeah. I liked that it was both for her I will say 2009 Harriet's a slightly weak link for me but not like in a horrible way they actually oh, yeah. don't she's not as dominant in 2009 as she is in 96 and 2020 which I'm yeah. fine with because I thought the actress they had was sweet and serviceable but I didn't want her on screen that much so it was actually a perfect balance that she wasn't there too much because she was almost like 
too sweetly vapid for me. There has to yeah. be a slight balance to Harriet for me personally. That said, in 2009 and 2020, I appreciated that we actually understood how they became friends and why, and the class uh, aspect of their social differences, which was never clear in 96. Yeah. Uh, because, and that, and that was just economy of storytelling in 96. There was, they didn't do an introduction yeah. scene of like her befriending Harriet. It's just understood that they're friends. Right. Well, like they had, so I, I looked because I was curious as to how she's introduced in each one. And like in 96, they have a scene where it's like a dinner party at Emma's house. And they're, and they're gossiping. And then like, they're yeah. there. And like, so Mrs. Goddard and Harriet are there. And then like Mr. Elton comes in, Emma intro like kind of, gives a little intro about Harriet to Mr. Elton. So anyway, you get like all these characters being introduced in one scene, which for me works because there's so many characters in Emma who need to be, you know, introduced. And like, they all, there's all these different threads in the book and they have to somehow figure out a way to do that like effectively. And especially in a movie, like you have way less time to do that, obviously. So um, like for me, it worked. I don't know, like you didn't have a question in your mind, like, who is this person? At least I didn't, but then you have, uh, in 2020, I felt like she, Harriet just like appeared almost. Like one day Emma doesn't have a friend and the next day she's like sitting, eating or drinking a tea with, with this girl. And you're like, who is she? And like, to the point where I had to ask the person I was watching the movie with, I was like, do you know who this is? Like, do you know who Harriet or Mrs. Goddard are? Like they keep, and they were like throwing out Mrs. Goddard a lot and like, they hadn't even introduced her. And I was just like, I was confused because for me, like, I feel like if uh, the three of us, like if we did that in a novel, we would have people being, we would have our editors being like, you didn't like make it clear who this person is, like what's going on here? But, um, but I don't know, like, it's interesting because they don't have hugely strong feelings about Harriet in general, but like, I think all three women, all three actresses did a good job. Yeah, honestly. I agree. Yeah. I guess uh, what I mean by, Maybe I couldn't I couldn't remember the exact introduction scene. I think what I liked in 2020 though is that I really understood what that school for girls was and Harriet's role there. I liked all the weird handmaid's tale yeah, like, yeah. talking things. Like it was quirky and I was Maybe like I don't know. Tales, didn't they? Yeah. 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 And I was like, I guess although the weird thing where they do the sand thing, I didn't quite understand that, but it was quirky. Um <laughs> <laughs> but like I yeah. guess I, I think that each of the ones has a different focus. 96 is a rom, a historical rom-com and it's, I do think it does that brilliantly. 2009 really focuses on the past and almost fate in a way. And like, cause you have Emma like almost seeing ghosts in the house a few times where she's like looking back and you get like a, and it's about reconciling childhood and growing up. But I feel mm -hmm. like the, the 2021 uh, really big focus on friendship. Harriet is far more foundational in the 2021. Yeah. Like I felt their scene when like they almost had like a friendship breakup when they were fighting. I was right. upset. Like it, uh, again, the 2020 yeah, like, the, the 2021 was the one adaptation where I was kind of going, I hope, although I think even in the book, it mentions that and now that she was Mrs. Martin, they really weren't going to hang out anymore, but you almost hope that that's not going to happen. You're like, yeah. You girls are good for each other in a really weird way. You're you're, yeah. you're, you're okay for each other. Cause Anya played Emma so lonely. And so I really, I guess I really felt the friendship thread in the 2021 and I liked that about it. Yeah. So, but in fairness, that might be at the expense of Knightley. Cause I didn't feel like they were as friendly with each other. Mm. So yeah. I don't know. I, don't I also really want to see it again. I saw it in early February and I feel like it's half out of my brain. I know, so right? Um, but it's it's only available for digital purchase currently, and I only like physical movies, and I'm not paying twenty four ninety five. So <laughs> there you go. I have yeah, um, I was gonna say, uh, do you guys have opinions about the ballroom scene? Because like for me, like rewatching '09, I was like, I thought their dance together was so sweet and so like. You know, they it had just like this sweet feeling that it evoked for me, and I was sitting there smiling the whole time. And like, yes, oh, is. this is like when they fall in love. But, like, I mean, yeah. maybe she doesn't get it, but it's happening. Yeah, and then, yeah. I, I, really I think know. that one. I agree with you. I think that one is extremely sweet. That is, again, this is there's a reason that the 2009 one is the one I just like to rewatch just for for good fun feelings. Um, mm -hmm. I like the 2021 because I, I don't know if you ever had that experience of like you've known somebody and. 
and you may and you usually find that person somewhat attractive, but in the way that most people are somewhat attractive. And then suddenly there's that one moment when you go, oh, oh no. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I've suddenly forgotten how to talk to you. Ah, you know, and and just and that was an emotion that I think is a very powerful one. And I thought that the 2021 did a really good job of getting across that emotion. I agree in terms of just the sheer ballroom scene. I think I like 2009 the most, hmm. but 2020, I just, it just, I, it struck me the most. I, I think the funny thing is despite how satirical and sharp edged the 2020 movie can be, it also is the one that for me hit the most emotional notes. Like I actually started crying when she hurt Miss Bates at the box hill scene. Alexa can attest to this. I was sitting there just like weeping. I was like, why am I crying about this? It was upsetting. And and so I felt I felt a lot more in the 2020 movie than I felt in any previous adaptation of Emma, and I liked that. Hmm. I just such a personal thing. Yeah, I remember the dancing as just being sexy. I I mean, also don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Having a scene where it's like, and now nightly show completely undressed for you, and I'm like, very well. (laughs) (laughs) May he proceed. That's good. Um, Let's but see. no, I was trying. Go ahead. I was just gonna say I agree about 2009. Though, like, I mean, in fairness, that's my favorite adaptation. Um, that 2009 ballroom scene, like, I was so like wibbly about it. I mean, this is my first book I wrote that is not published, but I definitely have a scene in there inspired by that scene. So that's how Aww. much I liked it. When you write Aww. fanfic, basically, you know, ah, oh, just oh, the song and the the entire sequence was so well done. Um, like when she's dancing and Harriet is being snubbed, like just the, the way it was edited and shot was just the whole emotional arc. And then to the final dance with Knightley was just beautifully done. Yeah. 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 And oh, Elton. Oh, speaking of, I do want to briefly say this is casting. The 2020 Mrs. Elton is my favorite Mrs. Elton. She's real good. She's ridiculous. She's and real good. I was like, I can't believe the chick from uh, sex education is now the best Mrs. Elton. I was like, how do I recognize her? Yeah, she's in sex education. And she's also, I liked that she's weirdly young. Cause I'm like, realistically, oh, yeah. he goes off to Bath. He would bring, he would get a young, ridiculous rich wife. And the other Mrs. Elton's always felt almost too old to me. Yeah. But hindsight. Yeah. Even like, if you need a bitchy woman in an Austin adaptation, you get Christina Cole. Of course you do. But like 2009, she felt too old almost. Like she felt like, but regardless, she was still really good. But uh, I love the 2020 Mrs. Elton. She's savage. I also, uh, speaking of Elton's, so actually here's one thing I'll give the 1996. Uh, it has my favorite Mr. Elton. Uh, he's the best. Alan, Alan, Alan Cumming. Yeah, he's great. And, and yeah. well, partly I just love Alan Cumming. I mean, anytime Alan right. Cumming does anything, I'm very happy. But also because He's the one Mr. Elton I could believe Emma would have looked at and said, he's probably a real nice guy because he's got that charming nature. Mm -hmm. He's got the affability. And so when it's revealed just what a snake he is, when he, you know, goes like, I don't care if Miss Smith is dead or not. (laughs) Right. You're like, oh, you son of a bitch. You had me fooled. Oh, and your circle of friends too. Alan Cumming has a talent. How many other people have seen Circle of Friends, I wonder? But yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, all five favorite it. movies, so... It's a good one. It's a good one. Tragically out of, like, print, by the way. Like, hard to find. So glad for my DVD collection. My oh mother my gosh, I was dumb to have DVDs. And now I'm like, who has Circle of Friends on DVD? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot he was in that, honestly. And, like, now I was just, like, thinking, like, what is he playing in that movie? And now I remember. Yeah. John. He's, like, crazy in that movie. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Also, Colin Firth, the baddie. Movie, chubby Colin Firth. It was yes. pre Pride and Prejudice, or like oh my uh, god, yes, at the same yeah. time, like Blast from the Past. Yeah, and he's awful in it too. <laughs> right? I mean, like an awful, an awful character. Not like bad when I saw Pride and Prejudice '95, which I saw, I didn't see '95. I saw it for the first time in 2001. I was like, "Excuse me, the villain from Circle of Friends? Excuse me." <laughs> and then I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to go off topic. Um, we talk about movies from the 90s on this forever. <laughs> I mean, why no, not? It's it's a beautiful thing. Uh, but I, I know, and don't get me wrong, I really liked the 2020 Mr. Elton as well. He was 
he was fun in a way that fit the tone of that film. Yeah. He was sharp yeah. and ridiculous, and I and I really really liked it. But I do think that in terms of if I'm going around, which of these people do, would I put in the Austin adaptation yeah. of Wendell all Austin adaptations? Uh, Alan Cumming goes in that one. Yeah. Oh, Jacqueline in the comments also has Circle of Friends on DVD. Oh, <laughs> Good. of course you do. <laughs> Anyone watching this is like, what is Circle of Friends? Change your life. It's a <laughs> It's a lot of it's a lot of people who were real big in the '90s, like Mini Drivers in it. Yeah. I think Stephen Burrows in it, Alan Cumming, Chris O'Donnell, and it's Irish and it's adorable and it's fun and yeah, check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. that's the movie that gave me false hope for my romantic prospects as an overweight person, though. So I'm glad it exists, no. but yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> no, that's why I liked it as a kid. I saw myself in it. Oh, and then you find out how the actresses always have to gain 40 pounds to play those parts. And you go, oh, okay. Anyway. I was adorable in that movie. And I'll just so good. defy anyone who says otherwise. Um, so let's see. Was there anything we haven't covered that or that other people want us to, to talk about? Um, I would just like to say through. something brief about costumes. Yes. Um, yeah. I just thought that like 2020, the costumes were insane. They were so well done. Um, I, yeah. At least for me, it was the first Emma where the difference between what Emma wears and what Harriet wears just like smacked me in the face. I just really liked how they did it. I thought yeah. it was really brilliantly drawn just to demonstrate at every available opportunity how wealthy Emma is compared to basically everyone else. I yeah. I, I'm just, I like looking at all of the costumes. They're so cool. And not to mention also that I like they kept up the seasonal thing. It's, uh, it's yeah. also as someone who has a real hard time keeping track of when things are happening, it's really nice when it's, oh yes, and now we're in the winter scenes because they're wearing cranberry and, as opposed to russet or <laughs> things like that. <laughs> it also gave it oh, like no, a quaint uh, feel, sorry. Yeah, no, I thought the costumes were super interesting. I kept wondering if they were, like, they're beautiful. They're beautiful to look at. I thought the whole production design was beautiful. But, like, the, I kept wondering to myself, like, is this accurate? Like, I don't think it is. But, like, also, I'm not a costume expert, so I'm not going to go there. But, like, There's just a video specifically, the, the, like, collar around her neck with that's not, not attached accurate. to anything. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, that annoyed me. I right. watched the video on the, on the costumes yesterday. Um, she complimented everything except for those two collars. Okay. She, she, but she gave them a free pass because she was like creative license, but I side eyed. So you're you're yeah. correct. The the solo collars were yeah bonkers. But she said yeah. the silhouettes were impeccable. Really good choices mm -hmm. with fabric and details and colors. So is this Kara? Is this you said this is a YouTube video you saw, or? Uh, it's the, um, oh, what's her name? She has a ton of viral videos. She dressed as like a Victorian all the time. Oh. You can definitely find it. I'll throw links into the description of the video. Uh, really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I love uh, loving on historical costumes and then seeing videos of why I have terrible taste and I'm completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she gave it a free pass. Uh, the, she did say the curls, definitely intentionally anachronistic because you cannot get those curls uh, from rags. Okay. Yeah. That, I was it was the one I actually did think that. I kind of, I, I actually was thinking that I was sitting in the movie watching that going, how did they get those curls? It's amazing. Yeah. 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 No, that's interesting. I think, uh, and then I was looking at the costume, or the one particular costume I loved from 2009 was her ballroom dress because it's like pink and sheer. And it's just, it looks great in the moon, in the uh, candlelight or whatever they did. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then I, I do love the costumes that they put Gwyneth in, but um, everyone else's costumes in 96 are kind of the women's costumes, yeah. are, you know, clearly like less nice. And then yeah. I do think the men look good though. Um, mm -hmm. Probably in all three versions, yeah. the men look fine. You usually can't quarrel with men's costumes. It's always the, you kind of live or die by the women's because that's where you can yeah. tell things like, how are they handling necklines and all right. that kind of stuff. Not right. to be a purist, except we will discuss soon the bad Mansfield Park. I will just talk about necklines Ooh. for an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah that'll be I great. should have opinions on the decolletage of a Jane Austen heroine, is oh. all I have to say. <laughs> Strong opinions. I shouldn't see it that much. Uh, she would be stoned if she had her boobs out. Come on. 
Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> well, we're going to have to cut down on cursing and right there, but I'm trying to cut down on cursing and inappropriate jokes for your channel. So, right, right. <laughs> You're really proud of me. I'm really trying. Do we have like any other specific things we want to talk about overall points? Um, oh, can we can we quickly discuss the Box Hill scene? Because for me, that is the pivotal moment. That yeah. is the most important dramatic moment in Emma because it is the moment when Emma realizes that she is kind of a jerk. And um and it goes in ascending order from like least to like most, 96, 09, 2020. And I will never forget when Alexa and I were watching 2020 movie in the theater. And it was so it funny. Was amazing. Also, there's She's another clearly thing. never seen Emma, someone okay. in the theater. So like we're we're, in a, we're actually in a fairly full theater, which was nice. Yeah. And Emma does that line where she goes, "Oh well, you know, you, you how do you stop it? Like three dull things." And the entire yeah. audience went, <gasps> "Like oh my god, god. Nah. But wasn't there one behind us? Like, you know, someone, like, it was amazing. And then also my other favorite thing was that. 20, 15 minutes later, when Emma's talking to Mr. and Mrs. Weston, and they're talking about Frank, and they're like, Emma, we have some really bad news. That's when, yeah. Um, Frank is actually engaged to Jane Fairfax. Some woman, two seats in front of us, went, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> it was like, these people's minds were blown. Oh. This, is, this is why you should keep readapting the classics. There's going to be some yeah. people you haven't yeah. seen, Emma, and it's going to blow your mind. Anyway, that's like a total detour, but and, um, but no, but that's great. Like, it's great that when it, when people like get that moment, you know, and yeah. regardless of the adaptation, you know, yeah. if they're getting the feels that, that we get from yeah. watching them over yeah. and over again. That's and cool. well, well, the other thing, last thing I'd say about that is that one person we haven't talked about is Miss Bates. Mm -hmm. And Miss Bates is interesting because she is simultaneously the, the minor buffoon clown character. And yet because of, she's incredibly important because she's instrumental to that scene. She's instrumental to that moment for Emma. And what I liked about the 2021 was that uh, this Miss Bates was ridiculous and silly like all the others. And yet there was something kind of pathetic about her that you could kind of, and, and this really has a lot to do with the actress who played her. I think Miranda Hart, she did a wonderful job. Right. And so, she's you know, she's, she's like in her, she's in her forties, she's in her fifties, you know, life's not gonna get any nicer to her. She's kind of a, a sweet buffoon. And, and but sweet is a very important word. There isn't a moment in her that you're not simultaneously annoyed, or you also are kind of like, oh, honey. So when Emma says that to her, and you see her like absorb it, and she's about to cry, I just like burst into tears. And for me, that's why it's that that almost for me is the reason 2020 is the superior in my mind adaptation because it's the one adaptation that really drives home what a terrible thing Emma did, and that really drives home what a change she has to make in her life. Um, and that for me is just, that was the moment. That was the thing. Yeah. Well, to yeah. that point, it might've also landed even better um, because don't forget, Jane's a bitch in this version. So what does Miss Bates have? She's such a sad character in a yeah. relatable way, unfortunately. <laughs> for me, a woman of a certain age. Uh, <laughs> Who doesn't have a niece to dote on? Um, but no, I mean you're right. I though so I feel all three of them. Like if that yeah. scene doesn't punch you in the face, the adaptations failed, and luckily none of them have so far. They all nail it. There's just yeah. there's different degrees of emotional response because it's how Emma says it. You're absolutely you know right. Like Anya Taylor Joy is so intentional, whereas Ramala Gray, it's like a like she doesn't even yeah. like right. she's not even rolls off. And it, Grant Paltrow does it knowing it's going to hurt. Ramal Garai doesn't even think about it. Yeah. And Anya Taylor Joy is in the moment, and suddenly, as soon as she says it, realizes yeah. what she did. And yeah. it's just real good. Oh, also, one quick thing about the 96. Uh, Miss Bates, in that version, I, I looked it up, is played by Sophie Thompson, who I think is the sister of Emma Thompson. Just yeah, like, she is. And her year for Austin and the Thompson family. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but she is, I looked her up, she was, I think, 33 or 34 when she made that movie. And so Miss Bates was actually relatively young, um, even though at the time, 33, 34-year-old woman would have been like, oh, you're ancient, careful, grandma, going oh. downstairs. But e even though that's the case, we still watch things with, a, from, with our modern brains. And to us, the 34-year-old woman doesn't look like your life's over, honey. So 
they, in some ways it undercuts the drama because you're like, she can still turn her life around. Whereas, you know, a 40, if a 50 something year old Miss Bates is like, mm, girl, mm. that is not nice. Yeah. Well, actually randomly in the Beckinsale version, I think Miss Bates is like quite older, quite a bit older. So like it is, it's like, ooh, this is yeah. sad. But it's always sad. And I'm yeah. glad that like all three versions like recognize that that is a pivotal moment. Yes. And yeah. get some justice to it. And Knightley's reaction to it, like, cause it's, right, the act, it's his badly done Emma speech yeah. is you get like a punch here and then you get a punch here. You watch them and oh, so good. I, I, I can't, I don't know if I can pick a favorite, honestly. I like them all, but going to the Paltrow the least just cause it's going to, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I can but add it, but it is hindsight. I, I loved it when I first saw it, and I was that viewer. I mean, we all were at one point where it was like, I, I think that's why I have feelings about Ewan's Frank Churchill that I do because I was shocked because I fully believed he was into Gwyneth Paltrow. I was so <laughs> upset. So upset. <laughs> they got me. Oh, that's great. Well, the only thing we haven't like mentioned, which some people have talked uh, in some of the comments, is Clueless, which I think. I mean, I know I love, and I imagine you I love it too. It's yeah, it honestly might be the best Emma, but we purposely want to do the historical Jane Austen right. adaptations yeah. to save the modern ones for possible other discussions. Possibly in the future. Yeah, we have to talk about them in a very different context. I adore Clueless. I mean, actually, yes, that yeah. is the first time I ever saw Emma. It was Clueless. Also, me too. So I have a weird relationship to the Clueless, partly because my last name is Clues and it's spelled C-L-U-E-S-S. So I've gotten Ms. Clueless a lot in my life. Aww. So honestly, I saw someone responding to Alexa, your your tweet poll the other day. And it's like, which Austin adaptation is your favorite? And I saw Clueless and I'm like, don't make fun of my name. Oh, oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> trauma. Okay. okay. Like, childhood trauma was just relived. But yeah, no, I, I think the Clueless... I think Clueless could be um, the the best Emma adaptation, if we mean adaptation in the sense that all yeah. permutations are put into consideration. I at least personally think Ty is the best Harriet. Like the way that yeah, they yeah. did Absolutely. her character. I Absolutely. like it's just, in a modern teen comedy, it just makes so much sense. Like, the, the loser girl and the skater boyfriend. I just, it's so, okay. We'll stay there no, for a minute. It's so brilliantly done. And, <laughs> and Josh, oh, Josh. Oh, he's great. <laughs> man who doesn't age. <laughs> oh, man. The great Paul Rudd. Yes, oh. indeed. But that's just such a good well, one. All right, so we save that for another day, hopefully. Yeah, save for but, another day. Yes, is that, have we, have we talked about it all? I mean, like, I feel like we've talked, we covered a huge amount of stuff. <laughs> And oh, we didn't yeah. mean to like be really mean about your favorite Emma. The, the thing is, at least for me, the margins between favorite and least favorite are very thin because I have such overwhelming nostalgia for the 1996 Emma. Like it was the only juicy, like historical Emma we had for more than 10 years. And it, it really, yeah. but then like 2009, man, just mm, got me. So. And I'm excited yeah. to have 2020 because I'm like, is this a resurgence of Austin adaptations? Because yes, please. That would be great. So. Them in a really long time. Focus features. Come on. Yeah. So, it, does, it does good work. It does good work. I, really, in the 90s. I really liked their adaptation of Vanity Fair that came out like 15 years ago with Reese Witherspoon. Oh, I, no. I, know, I know it is not a very faithful adaptation, but I, I, I enjoyed watching it. And I, I, just like, I like it. it. Cuz we had all sorts of movies in the 90s and into the early 2000s that were like adapting classics or they at least set in that period. We had lots of movies that were like um like uh, was it Being Julia was it called? Like, yeah, was that the one with Being Jane? Jane? She's a different Jane. For Jane, for Jane <laughs> becoming <laughs> Jane. <laughs> Can we just have a resurgence of Hollywood movies that are period films, please? Of yeah. This era? Yes, um, yes. Or yes. the BBC can make some more. They haven't done like the a run of them in a while. And also, can we have them erase uh, two out of three of the ITV adaptations from our memory, please? So, yeah. <laughs> some oh, of I, which we're going to be talking about. I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say Sanditon for a second. Which well, Jenica has I didn't get into that because everyone lost their minds. <laughs> yes, I feel like. 
Yes, Sanditon is also divisive, and I don't know that we should go into it right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sanditon, like I, like I hear like Spartacus, like Sanditon, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's just fascinating, because it's kind of like, it's like they really wanted like fresh Jane Austen material, and I'm like, persuasion has been wronged and overlooked. <laughs> it is right there. It's true. Doing. And Northanger Abbey, which doesn't get Northanger Abbey. So yeah, Northanger Abbey, stung. I mean, I can understand why it doesn't, Northanger Abbey isn't nearly what Emma is or Pride and Prejudice is. I mean, it, there's no question, but Northanger Abbey is still a lot of fun. And if you're yeah. looking for fun right now, you can, yeah. I, th I think it might be pound for pound. Well, Pride and Prejudice, I think, is the most fun Austin, but I think that Northanger Abbey has a lot of opportunity for some good laughs and also people don't know every inch of it. So yeah, yeah. on the Northanger Abbey episode, we'll, we'll talk about how I literally forgot the entire plot until <laughs> that night. Uh, so I had a delightful time watching it, spoiler alert, because it, it felt new to me because I have not read that book in a long time. So yeah, okay. bad Austin. So, yeah. So it's actually because I heard the IT, and this is like ahead of us, but I heard the ITV Mansfield Park was so bad that I not only didn't watch it, but I didn't watch Northanger Abbey, which I really uh, kind of sold myself short there. So, And then I have feelings about Persuasion, and that is the whole point of this series. We have feelings about all of these adaptations. One thing I'll say about Persuasion very, very quickly, even though we're doing Emma, is that I saw the one with Sally Hawkins. That, that's the one I'm that. talking about. Okay. And, uh, and there's things I like about it, but one thing that really kind of... Uh, befuddled me is the fact that the last 10 minutes of the show, she's literally running all over that. <laughs> like, right? like she's a six million dollar man, like her theme song is playing, she runs here, she runs there. It, it got comical and I'm like, I don't know yeah. that I don't know that yeah. you want to like, show up to your beloved Frederick Wentworth being like I got the Totally <laughs> sweating and out of breath. Yeah. Honestly, like ITV yeah. bless them, they just don't have the budgets to do Austin correctly most mm. of the time. I'm like, come on, BBC. You'll th they'll hire Andrew Davies and spend the money. Yeah. So, although Andrew Davies did North Hanger, which is probably why it's not that Thank bad. You, Little cat appearance. Mm. Um, so do we want to wrap it up? Yes, let's yeah. do. Thank, Thank you me. so much, guys. Uh, Jessica, remind us your book again. And when oh, yes, hello, it's coming out. Uh, coming out May 12th in three days, uh, House of dragons. It is like YA Game of Thrones slash Breakfast Club, but with dragons. Please Yay. to buy it. Please to buy. Thank you. Is there an indie bookstore that you yes. love or bookstores that you want um, to? Well, of course, to any and all indies are good. Uh, in, in my, well, I mean, there's Romans in Pasadena. There's Once Upon a Time Bookshop. And I think Roseville, I don't know. I can't, I don't remember names. I don't na remember names of cities anymore. My brain is shot from, from <laughs> quarantine. But yeah. uh, yes, please support your indies. Please support your indie bookstores. Please, please, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you can buy physical hardcover books, we love you. It would help. Yeah. Right. We love you <laughs> too, but please buy hardcovers. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you can. Um, Jenica? Yes, next. Next coming up, guys. Uh, we are doing Mansfield Park, which is why we've been kind of talking about it so much, with Jacqueline Ferkins, who is uh, the author, who's here, but like she's the author of um, Heartstrings and Other Breakable Things, which is a contemporary YA that is based on Mansfield Park, actually. So she's the perfect person to talk about Mansfield Park with. And that is going to be Saturday the 23rd at 2 p.m. Oh, again, 2 p.m. Pacific. Again. So and please cool. join us. I'll Post rush. everything up, uh, and well, I can tell you now where to stream. You can stream Mansfield Park the movie from 1999 on Netflix. We picked it next because Netflix is so accessible. Also, it's an amazing movie. It's kind of underappreciated. We're hoping some new people discover it. And then yeah. you can, if you would like, watch the bad Mansfield Park that I've been referencing. It's a <laughs> masterpiece. I watched it for the first time last night, and it was bad. Um, there were <laughs> the first, I saw the first step. Hour of it once, and it and was just hair. Like, now no. the hair. I'm still upset, uh, so we can talk about that. And Jacqueline is an expert in costumes, and so yes, I hope that she will tell me things that will be interesting about all my really strong negative reactions to the Bad Mansfield Park. <laughs> well, with Billy Piper for reference. So yes, so you guys can watch either one um, or both, whatever. Watch you the like. good one. Let's be but real. Yeah, watch, watch the good one. one. It's on Netflix. It's easy to access. We have a Netflix. So. 
do that for sure. Um, it also has Johnny Lee Miller in it. It does. Yes. So little connection. Like uh, so. six degrees of Johnny Miller, but Johnny Lee Miller, but the Jane Austen adaptations. Is he in any others? Probably not. Just those two. No. But yeah. What strikes me is he's so lovely and vulnerable. And then I just remember that he married Angelina Jolie. And it just it hits me sometimes. And I'm just like, the 90s what? were such a weird time. The 90s were truly the end of sanity. And then uh, we just, we just, got, we dove off a cliff in 2000 and we're still going. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, they did get divorced a long time ago. I believe. There you They're go. Friends. They're allegedly still friends, but who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yes. He's playing Austin. John Lee Miller would like to comment. Blood around her neck. So I know this is deep cuts to the '90s, but you know. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, the '90s, man. Yeah, it was a time. <laughs> man, well, I'm gonna go uh, polish my. My, my, my cane, I suppose, and just uh, hobble around. <laughs> are they going to say, like, your Doc Martens or something? All the people I mean, now I still wear them. They are back, back, by the way. Cane. So <laughs> they are back. They are. I mean, Doc Martens now. I was shocked. I mean, it's fine. You know, whenever, whenever I see the kids today doing, like, man, I wish it was the 90s, I just, like, hobble in with my walker and go, you don't want it. It was all right. <laughs> we didn't we have, have the answer. Answer. Yeah. Like, not really. Grant, granted, the world wasn't literally falling apart. I mean, no, I no. I mean, some and I'll just say, like, we can. I mean, Jesse, you and I are both like kind of film snobs. It's in a good way. Yeah. Um, there's something beautiful about some of the movies from the '90s, even the blockbuster ones. Just like practical effects and original screenplays, guys. I miss those. Oh, yes, I'm a lot. I do too. I miss <laughs> screenplays were an original. Like the adaptations didn't feel the way they feel now. Like some of my favorite movies from the nineties are adaptations, like Toilet Club and Contact, or yeah, even Clueless. Uh, yeah, yes, I don't know. I don't know. awesome. I, mean, I wouldn't say the I wouldn't put Clueless in this category, but I think that a lot of the adaptations from the nineties also were just kind of like we're just going to do it earnestly, and I don't think you do anything earnestly anymore. Now it's just yeah. it's just layer upon layer of style and snark and i'm like i'm so tired and stuff well it's not style but snark's all i have and i'm just tired of it oh well we just kind yeah. of like, it was like a simpler time i guess i mean probably because we were younger but also it was because it really really was. what's happening now so jeez. Uh, uh, I, I did I did think about sometimes just as we're leaving um sometimes i think about when i was 1990 when i was 12 years old I thought to myself, oh man, all the history's already happened. And I kind of wish I could get in a time machine, go back, like portal into my old bedroom. Go, okay, first of all, first of all, punch myself in the face. Second of all, go, okay, listen, uh, re reality television star is going to be president. Uh, there's a plague on. Unfortunately, time travel does not exist, but I had to even make a point. Okay, bye. And then just like go back. And I'd be like, wow, that was really amazing. Anyway. Just enjoy it while you can. Yeah. Well, so that's why we're talking Austin because Austin is a nice escape. And so, like, we should it leave, it, leave it on something positive. I think it's a it's a time travel machine. Yeah, absolutely. It's all time. Like that. That's less fun. Watch the good Austins. We'll guide yes. you. Okay. All right, so let's wrap it up. Don't forget to join us in two weeks on Saturday, May twenty third, for Mansfield Park. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me. By Jessica's book, by Jenica's book, Dangerous Alliance, by mine if you want. I don't care. I mean, I'm here all the time. Like, <laughs> but although I guess if you're here and you're an Austin fan, uh, The Stars We Steal is a loose uh, retelling of persuasion set in space. But I did have to change Anne Elliot and Wenworth, so don't hate me. It's and so much fun. Oh my God. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, oh, I did make changes. But, you know, we'll talk about some of the movies. You have to make changes to yeah. make some of them work. Um, Mansfield Mansfield Park. That is a theme for next week. That sometimes you have to radically change something in order to to make it work, even if you love the original. So, yes. well, although we'll, we'll we're going to we'll talk, talk about it. We'll we're talk, gonna, about we're it. talk about passive heroines anyway. Yes. Thanks so much, everyone. Had a really <laughs> great time. Uh, we'll drop some of those links we mentioned down below in the description box. And thank you for joining me. And bye, everyone.